and welcome to a new episode of Veil Lifted, a video essay where I discuss fascinating cases that involve secrecy and discovery. Today, we will be discussing James Arthur Ray. Ray was born in November of 1957. His father was a preacher at the Red Fork Church of God in Tulsa. Even as a child, Ray's mother said she saw something in him that strived for more in life, something larger and more significant. In his text, Harmonic Wealth, Ray bemoaned the fact that he experienced a level of poverty in his childhood. His haircuts were given by his mother, and he didn't get new clothing. This caused him to question God. How could a preacher not be favored at all? even not be able to own a home due to poverty. Ray stated, here's what I know, it's a sin to be poor. This mentality would stick with him for the rest of his life, but would also be a part of his downfall. Though Ray often described himself as an outcast that was made fun of due to his appearance, former classmates claimed that he leaned far into a rags into riches trope. They said he had an air of confidence and that his version of poverty was nowhere near that of his peers. In 1976, Ray earned an associate's degree and went on to try to transform his outer physique, which had remained a source of insecurity due to his experiences at school. However, he soon came to the realization that the core of his attention was no longer on what he wanted. The improvement of his mind and mindset. Ray allegedly worked at AT&T for nearly 10 years. It was at this time that his journey with self-help truly began. He used Stephen R. Covey's bestseller, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Ray's character began to show when on his website he claimed alliance with the Covey Leadership Center, which later turned into four years working with best-selling author Stephen Covey. Neither of these claims were true, but were rather particularly worded ways to associate himself with a self-help giant. He later on said that he had taught Covey's techniques at AT&T. However, he was again caught in a lie as he claimed that he had worked as a contract employee for Covey. A spokesperson for Covey claimed there had never been any direct connection with Ray. The self-aggrandizing behavior was only beginning to rear its head, but it would not be long until it turned into part of his brand. During his time with AT&T, and the reading of Kobe's texts, Ray realized he wanted more for himself and began his own company, the Quantum Consulting Group, which somehow then turned into Ray Transformation Technologies, and then into James Ray and Associates. At this point, Ray's job was centered on giving speeches to invigorate employees of MLM companies such as Herbalife. In the years between 1996 and 2006, Ray was somewhat lost. It did not seem as though he had truly found his calling, or at least hadn't found a specific enough mindset to build off of. For this reason, he began to search spiritual awakening. He allegedly solicited shamans and other spiritually awakened authorities in order to find answers. In his text, he wrote that he spent one night at the top of Mount Sinai and apparently achieved an immense awakening, an epiphany, in the same cave where the Ten Commandments came to Moses. While his accounts seem larger than life, theatrical, and effectively false, they did appeal to an audience he was about to tap into in a significant way. After, like Moses, receiving his own laws, Ray was interviewed by Rhonda Byrne, author of the extremely famous and best-selling text, The Secret. The text The Secret rose to fame for its inspirational tone underlining the law of attraction and the fact that our thoughts can change our lives in drastic ways. The text eventually became a film, and none other than Ray was amongst those chosen to speak. This was where he truly rose to a new level of recognition. Many of his followers discovered him this way, and it bode particularly well that he was now associated with others who were far more experienced in the same Field. It is important to pause for an instance and consider the field of self-help generally. Though self-help technically already existed in the 16 and 1700s, the self-help we know and recognize today began in the early 20th century with texts such as James Allen's As a Man Thinketh and Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. Although separated by a few decades, both of these texts emphasize the importance of our thoughts in regards to our morale and our success in the desired fields. Though there are certainly many self-help books and speakers that have helped their audiences change their lives and how they perceive life, there is an argument to be made about the validity of self-help. A few academics have claimed that much of self-help is pseudoscientific or pseudo-psychological babble that merely tells the masses what they want to hear. Christopher Buckley, the political satirist, in his book, God is My Broker, claimed the only way to get rich from a self-help book is to write one. Both sides of the argument have validity to them. Even if all self-help were all a placebo, if it yields positive results, it's still worthy, right? Well, Ray is going to show us that even with potentially good intentions, a simple teacher or guide may turn into more of a leader that borders on the cultish. After appearing in the video of The Secret, Ray was asked to come onto the Oprah Winfrey show along with other revered authors and speakers in the self 
self-help community or new age community. After this, Oprah had been so impressed and wowed by what Ray shared that she invited him back onto the show the very next day. This amount of attention on Ray is truly what made him rise to the top. At that point, in the early 2000s, there were very select few public speakers who were known for their self-help books and seminars, one of which being Tony Robbins. To this day, he remains a household name. Ray strived to be at that level of fame and respect. Of course, the money that came along with the admiration played a large part in his motivation to become one of the household greats. As with many leadership or self-help events, the speaker often offers an initial free event in order to pique the audience's interest. From there, each subsequent event grows more expensive until there typically is the final peak event, which is often marketed as true awakening. Ray followed this formula where his first event was free and then he'd have multi-day events, then trips, and at the top of the pyramid, the final goal was the spiritual world warrior level. Prior to reaching those peak levels of spiritual awakening, Ray usually made speeches that involved the public and framed the conversation in such a way to lead some kind of breakthrough. Sometimes he'd ask an audience member what they feel like they couldn't do at that very moment in the conference room. One woman responded that she felt she couldn't sing in front of the 300 people there. Ray had put an emphasis on not caring about what others thought or said, so he asked her to sing. She eventually did and the audience clapped and showed a massive amount of support because she'd had a breakthrough. This was a formulaic strategy that Ray employed to make his audience feel as though they'd truly broken through a barrier that was holding them back. While the example of the woman putting her embarrassment aside to sing is a feel-good example, the other side of the coin is that these breakthroughs were often somewhat manipulative as many of Ray's followers did claim the fear of disappointing him. Effectively, that woman who sang was also put on the spot to do so and if she didn't, she probably would have been ashamed. This may be part of the breakthrough in Ray's eyes, but it's important to keep an eye on his impact as a figure of power. Other examples of his simulated breakthroughs was the cliche breaking through a board with the hand martial arts style. Many felt the endorphins course through their veins once they succeeded a feat that they thought was impossible. But did they think it was impossible to begin with? Or had Ray subtly framed it as such? Was the idea of impossibility in their heads before Ray said anything? Or did he plant the seed so the final result would suit his narrative? During one of those motivational board-breaking exercises, one woman tried multiple times and ended up sustaining multiple fractures. Some of Ray's employees have stated that he got angry that they called a doctor. It wasn't clear why, but the assumption would be that it was due to the fact that it could negatively affect his image. Unfortunately, this instance was the least tragic and only one of more that were coming his way. At his events, Ray often mentioned teachings he learned from shaman as well as from other spiritual gurus. This particular mention is important because it gave Ray a very specific leverage compared to other self-improvement speakers. It was an extra layer that came with him. He could offer real-world advice just like the others, but he claimed he had a level of spiritual knowledge that could open more avenues. Though his seminars were important within themselves, the shadow of spiritual warrior was the largest. It truly was like a finishing line that would let both the participant and Ray know that they'd gained the most they could and that they survived mentally and physically grueling activities. Ray was clear from the get-go spiritual warrior was not an easy program. He said it was difficult, intense, and would likely make people feel uncomfortable as that was a part of growth. The next follower of Ray mentioned that he said that people were either placeholders or growing, emphasizing the need to constantly be pushing their own boundaries. While this mindset is somewhat cutthroat, if put in motion with moderation and caution, it isn't inherently negative. However, as he is in the position of power, hearing it from him might have felt more like a slight or a call to action rather than a simple way of viewing life and progress. This intensity was very prevalent in the spiritual warrior event, as participants often needed to go to extremes to prove they were in fact quote-unquote ready to break through their boundaries and awaken as quote-unquote stronger individuals. The unfortunate reality was that much of what Ray claimed to be trained in was either untrue or highly embellished. This often caused trouble as he did not hire more particularly trained individuals to set up the exercises. In the 2006 edition of Spiritual Warrior, during an archery exercise, the participants were told to put the sharp end of an arrow up against their necks and lean on it. Unsurprisingly, this did not end well as a man arrow shaft snapped 
snapped, and the arrow point dug deeply into his eyebrow. He allegedly was close to losing his eye. While the participants had signed waivers in order to be part of Spiritual Warrior, there's debate on whether Ray did his due diligence in order to ensure that the waiver was merely a precaution rather than what he'd used to defend himself. In other words, did he do enough to make sure the participants were safe? This is a question that would be answered in 2009's Spiritual Warrior. A significant element to note about Spiritual Warrior as well is that it cost $10,000 to participate. With such a fee, it is hard to imagine that all precautions would not be set in place. In October 2009, a new edition of Spiritual Warrior took place. This event was located in Angel Valley, Sedona, which is an isolated area. This was the event that was meant to change the participants' lives, and it did, but not in the way it was intended to. In this three-day event, the participants were pushing their boundaries mentally and physically. Many had not drank or eaten in over 30 hours. They had also been challenged to let go of their vanity by shaving their heads. This was understandably a significant demand for long-haired men and women. While it may seem trivial, there was pressure put on the individual to shave. If not, it would appear as if they were holding on to their vanity and by proxy did not care about the teachings and the learning experience of spiritual warrior. There were many aspects of Ray's events that included such moments of forcing of the hand, but it was always implicit or out of fear of disappointing their leader, and therefore rarely truly their own choice. There was always pressure behind each act. Out of the entirety of the schedule of Spiritual Warrior, the final step, the Sweat Lodge, was the most anticipated of all the activities. Once more, Ray claimed to have more of an understanding of Sweat Lodges than he did. He claimed he had modeled his after Native American practice. However, it is important to note, in Native American traditions, there are always elders who monitor the situation, and they have training in order to conduct conduct the sweat lodge in a safe way along with the spiritual guidelines as well. Thankfully, all of the spiritual warrior experience audio was recorded until the sweat lodge activity began. Ray warned his participants about the type of heat they'd encounter, along with the discomfort it would cause. He said, The true spiritual warrior has conquered death. You just have to let go and say, if I'm going to die, it's okay. This statement might have been an attempt to make the experience more profound, but at its core, it is alarming, as the point of the experience was to live through it and come out as a changed individual. Before beginning, he also stated, I will promise you will have at least seven rounds, so you cannot leave during a round. If you feel like you cannot transcend and overcome this, then, when the gates are open, if you have to leave, you leave. It is interesting to note the diction used in this statement. Rather than being concerned of the well-being of the individual, Ray used the terms overcome and transcend, which imply weakness as the individual is not capable of getting past a certain threshold. Additionally, though it would not be ideal, it is bizarre that leaving between rounds would not be allowed, considering, for the most part, one would only leave if concerned about their health, which should be the priority. Once the participants entered the lodge, the heat was immediately overwhelming. They sat in circles, some closer to the heat rocks on which water would be dumped to cause steam and more heat. Others were towards the back. The heat got to around 200 degrees Fahrenheit, though there was no thermometer to give a precise degree. People began to grow lightheaded, some showed the symptoms of heat stroke, and those in the back had difficulty breathing at all. When exiting at the end of a round, some collapsed and had to be physically moved away. Some came out and were distressed at the thought of disappointing Ray if they did not go back in. Ray was seated by the exit of the lodge and allegedly would say such things as, it's a good day to die likely referring to the concept of leaving reborn. Chaos had already begun before they were halfway through the rounds. A participant had fallen and burned themselves on the heat rocks. Some were screaming. Some had lost consciousness. Others were speaking to one another about their feelings of distress. Instead of tending to the participants and have the lodge evacuated, Ray continued to tell those that wanted to leave the lodge that they could do it and they were more than that, again, using a manipulative tactic that relied on implying that they'd be weak to leave. The eighth round ended, and that is when the true seriousness of what had occurred was unveiled. Kirby Brown, a participant, was non-responsive and apparently had no pulse. She was pronounced dead on arrival at the medical center. James Shore, another participant, was also declared dead on arrival. He, however, had managed to save another by dragging them out of the lodge before he went back in and was found unconscious holding Brown's hand. Liz Newman, another participant, had fallen into a coma in the lodge and died of organ failure. These three deaths would end up shaking up 
all the faith Ray's followers had in him, as his behavior amidst crisis had been heinous. Witnesses allege that they'd made it known to Ray that people were beginning to show severe signs of being unwell and he took no action. A volunteer that was outside the lodge claimed that they were not allowed to call 911, seemingly a recurring aspect of his practices. In fact, in 2005, at a prior sweat lodge event, a participant was not responding well to the heat, and again, Ray refused to call 911. This led to the devastation of that participant, Daniel Fankuch's life. He went from a six-figure earning businessman to homeless and divorced. He claimed to have had an outer body experience that he'd never recovered from. When the participants of the 2009 sweat lodge saw the devastation, people vomiting, seizing, people with no pulse being carried away by the ambulance, they continued to ask where Ray was. Understandably, they looked him for answers and reassurance, yet he was nowhere to be found. When the police went to get Ray's statement, he was in his room, simply eating as if nothing had occurred. According to Ray, he was in shock, so he contacted his lawyer who advised him to leave. Ray left without even speaking to any of the surviving participants. He did not even assist the participants that he had convinced to go into the lodge. He simply fled and did not comply with the authorities. Initially, the deaths of Kirby Brown and James Shore were being investigated as homicide. Then, Liz Newman's family filed claiming wrongful death, negligence, and fraud. The unfortunate turnout was that Ray was found guilty on three counts of negligent homicide and was only sentenced to two years in prison. The positive aspect of this case getting so much attention was that the public was now seeing that Ray's behavior in terms of safety of his participants had always been lacking. In fact, only a few months prior to the Sweat Lodge tragedy, during a two-day seminar, are where for some reason Ray had instructed his participants to dress as though they were homeless, Colleen Conaway died. There is very little evidence to explain the details of why she jumped from the fourth floor of a shopping mall. While her death cannot be blamed on Ray, as there is no evidence to suggest as much, the way in which Ray handled it was once more suspicious. Ray had noticed Conaway was missing from the group, but did not search for her, and the group left the mall without her. Ray or his employees only contacted the police six hours after Conway's death. Due to the homeless exercise, Ray's staff had all of Conway's belongings, including her phone. For some reason, though, Ray's staff had left messages of concern on her phone when she was missing. Why would they do that knowing they had her phone? Why force an image of concern? This only adds to the suspicious nature of Ray's behavior. Where is Ray now? Since being released from prison, Ray is back to rebooting his empire, or he's attempting to at least. During his new speeches, he refers to what happened in 2009 and often alludes to it having to happen to him in order to learn important lessons. In an episode of the series Deadly Cults that discusses Ray's rise and fall, Kirby Brown's mother responds to Ray's claim that this tragedy had to happen to him by saying that, that her daughter did not need to die for him to learn. In fact, many may say this tragedy isn't his at all, as he was not even helping in the aftermath of his sweat lodge disaster. His only tragedy was now a failed business and a prison sentence. In retrospect, it is truly fascinating how Ray managed to have such a dedicated following, though he consistently let morally bankrupt aspects of himself slip. It speaks to his charisma as well as an audience who wanted someone to help them better themselves. Now, all we can do is watch Ray try to rebuild the empire he burned down. My opinion on this case is probably not very surprising. I am very skeptical of self-help. I actually went on a retreat, and I can link that video down below, of this self-help person that my mom trusted, and I went to kind of make sure nothing sketchy happened, and it was entirely sketchy and this person is very similar to Ray, so I guess I have that very personal bias. But overall, to me, I think Ray never really wanted to be a leader as much as he wanted to be kind of the god type figure, telling people what to do, telling people he was making them break through, telling people that they had to just follow him. And I mean, I understand that if you're gonna be a self-help mogul, you have to come across as confident and as someone who knows what they're doing, certainly. But at the same time, there's a difference between someone Someone who's confidently telling you, hey, I think you should do this, this, and this, and someone who is acting like they understand you better than you understand yourself, and that they know what's better for you, and that effectively manipulate you into doing things you don't want to do because you would never want to upset them, their god, right? So I feel like in this particular case, he started off with good intentions, but I think they got lost somewhere, or I think maybe the fame got to his head, but it's surreal to me that there were no 
standby ambulances or standby emergency services. At any event, you should have someone on standby, especially if it's something physically grueling like the sweat lodge or like the breaking of the blocks. It seems surreal to me that he wouldn't do that, and the only reason to me why he wouldn't do that is because he didn't want to spend the extra money, which then again demands, does he really care about these people's well-being at all, or is he just kind of pumping up his ego with having all these people look up to him. You guys can let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you to my patrons as always, and I'll catch you guys next time.